The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. The engines, right, the, the aircraft engines have a lot of sensors on them because, you know, the engines really need to work reliably. So mm -hmm. it tends to be more sort of structural, st thermostructural components. And my sense is in, in cars, you monitor more, you know, like electronics, you know, how many, you know, how many, emissions. certainly emissions, you know, it's slightly different what's being monitored and the sensors are different. And maybe even the companies that provide these sensors and health monitoring equipment are, are, tend to be different as well. So I, I, think, I think there's similar trends, but they're somewhat parallel. I don't think one came before the other. Okay. Yeah. Um, hey, Volker, Volker, do you want to mention something about um, health monitoring in general for well, operations? I just, sent you, uh, I just sent you a link on your email because uh, we've been for six years monitoring the health of SwissCube. That's up there, and it's a live it's a live link. So I don't know if you're able from your computer to, to open it. I just sent you the, the link on your on your email by any chance. So actually, uh, as it was the first satellite that we built here at EPFL a few years ago, uh, we figured we want to know everything. So uh, the primary and the redundant system were all uh, were sent, and every telemetry data is sent down at every pass and, and uh, kept actual, so uh, maybe at the break or whenever there's a yeah. chance to go onto that link and you can see the, the actual housekeeping data and you'll see that the battery uh, voltage is the only one that's red, it's slightly uh, below margin of the six years, which is uh, not bad for a DC system. Yep, okay, I'll pull it up during the break. Thanks, uh, thanks for that, that'll be interesting. Okay, uh, let's, let's move on. Um, so, unfortunately, so I would say the F-18, and there's a lot of systems that were designed with, uh, you know, operational excellence in mind, right? Maintainability, high reliability, that was a big thing. Um, I did mention this before, I think, but I just want to say that it's not always the case. So, uh, this is sort of the, uh, one of the counterexamples, the space shuttle. And I have a lot of respect. Don't, don't misunderstand me. I think people that worked on the shuttle did an amazing job. It was an amazing vehicle but things turned out quite differently than what was promised. I think that everybody will agree with that. So this is a, a paper that was actually a very short paper published, in, believe it or not, in Nature in 2011, right after the retirement of the shuttle, and uh, by Pilkey et al. And what they did is they looked at the costs of the shuttle program, and the cost is well known because this is all public money. This is all you know, money that was appropriated by Congress. And then the light blue bars are the number of uh, launches that happened in a particular year. So you can see the maximum was nine, nine launches in like 1984. Um, not a launch a week, like Congress had been told, right? Um, and so we have about 10 years of, of design and operate, 10 years of design, build, test, uh, until uh, initial operating capability. And then we have about 30 years of uh, actually usage and operations. And this is true for many systems. The operational phase is much longer than the design phase. So in, in this case, the operational phase was three years, 30 years, right? Three times longer than the actual design phase, which was about a decade. The vision was a partially reusable space vehicle, quick turnaround, high flight rate. What we actually got is a complex and fragile vehicle with an average cost of about $1.5 billion for flight and a workforce of about 20,000 people to keep the shuttle flying. Um, and you, I think I've she shown you this before, right? Did I show you this before? So this is sort of a, this is an original illustration from the proposal uh, to Congress, right? It kind of looks like the F-18, right, that I just showed you. It's, it's a hangar, um, pristine, a few people, a couple of ground support equipment carts. This is kind of like an airplane, right, like an airliner. And then this is what we actually got. This is a picture taken in the orbiter processing facility at the Kennedy Space Center. And you can't even see the shuttle, right? It's hidden behind the scaffolding and, um, and the main systems that required a lot of work between flights were the shuttle main engine 
and of course the TPS, the thermal prote protection system. Now you can say, well, why, did, why such a big discrepancy between what was promised, the vision, and what's actually delivered? And people will have different opinions. My opinion is it certainly over-optimism was a part of it, but also Congress capped the research development um, cost for the, the orbiter in particular to about $5.15 billion. There was actually an act of Congress that said, those shall not spend more than $5.15 billion on development of the orbiter. So then, you know, what was clear is you 24 metric tons to low Earth orbit. If you can't achieve that, the system will not satisfy the performance. So performance is king. And of course, this was also politically uh, challenging because there were military requirements and civilian requirements that had to be met. And then maintainability, like I said, is just doesn't happen automatically. You have to actually write requirements for maintainability. How long should it take? How many hours of work? You know, how, much, uh, how many actions or procedures to, to do certain maintenance actions? It has to be designed into the system. Therefore, the need for requirements. And then um, no realistic life cycle cost or value optimization. So that's, that's sort of, I think, the counterexample. But again, I, I, I'm not blaming individuals for this. It's, I'm blaming the system. Uh, for this, yes. Um, to what extent do you think that the kind of problems within shuttle can be traced to effectively uh, a failure to stop defining the requirements? I feel like when you look at uh, commercial launch systems, kind of as a comparison point, and I understand they're not reusable, <coughs> and they're not being designed to to necessarily the the same specifications as shuttle. But I feel like because the commercial launch industry has had standards set by NASA and the Air Force that they needed to meet, that they had a very clear set of requirements from the beginning, whereas the development of shuttle, right, like the failure to design for maintainability, it was kind of, when I look at the, the development cycle, it kind of looks like they continued to find requirements as they went um, and kind of discovered new things and then said, okay, so we need to do it this way. <clears throat> Instead of saying from the beginning, these are the requirements we know we have to meet, let's design to that. Right. It no, looks I like they kind of crept through the development phase to me, that there wasn't a hard stop. Um, so I was just wondering if you could comment on that kind of... It, it's definitely true that there was sort of reacting to, you know, and, and after the first few flights. So an interesting uh, uh, history there is the shuttle main engines. You know, they were kind of completely disassembled and inspected after the first couple of flights. But that wasn't supposed to be done every flight. It was supposed to be, you're going to launch them, I think, like five times before you actually do big, big inspections. But they had already done inspections after every flight, test flight, and then they just kept doing it. So something that was supposed to be only a um, maintenance action or inspection uh, during test flights became or crept into becoming an operational requirement. And of course, you know, you have a big workforce and, you know, there's jobs and so forth, so there's that too. But it was never intended that the shuttle main engines would be disassembled and rebuilt after every flight. Why were they, al why was that permitted? Well, I guess the feeling was, the sense was that uh, it would be safer to do that and that you really want to know what's the state of these engines. <coughs> and, um, you know, I will say this, I mean, at the contractual, you know, there's, there's jobs there, there's money there. And so the more maintenance actions you can do, you know, the more of a business this is. Uh, but of course, that's not what the vision was, right? The Do vision was very lean operations, few people. So there's a, there's a socioeconomic things tied up with it as well. Do you think that because that's a, inherently a government project, that's part of the reason, right? Like, whereas a, a commercial company is looking to cut as many employees as possible to increase profit margin? I, I think that that's a part of it. Yeah, okay. I do think that's a part of it. Um, um, yeah, absolutely. It's 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 a really interesting it's a really interesting history. There's there's a lot to be learned from this. Okay, so let me um, let me move on. So this is just kind of a um, a list, not a checklist really, but a list of operational considerations that you should think about when you design a system. So how will it be operated? And of course, you know we've done the conops a while ago, but this is sort of more detailed than the conops. You know how will you inspect the system, how you will you maintain it, how you will, you know, what insights do the operators need into the system status, right? So when you're operating the system, how much about the internal workings do you really need to know? This is the internal telemetry, temperatures, pressures, you know, um, in the avionics, you know, the electrical, um, 
I think the example of the electrical bus was good, the cryogenic system example. You know, how, how, how much insight do you need? Um, before turning over to the operators, what checks do you need to perform? How might the system fail? Think about failure systems. Uh, and you, you, of course, need to think about that as early as possible. What are the options are available to you in case you have failures? And you will have failures. Uh, what spares are needed to repair the system? Uh, will the system still perform even under partial failure? So maybe something failed, but not catastrophically. It's a partial failure. Can you keep going with the system? How, how far can you push the system? Right? These are all, I think if, if you think about, this is like five questions here, but I think they're five of the most important questions for operations. Now, uh, in terms of the NASA life cycle, uh, we're talking phase E here, just to be clear. So phase E is called operations and sustainment. And, you know, depending on what mission you're talking about, this could be short, right, like uh, the Apollo missions, like two weeks, right, and they're back, back home. Uh, ISS, you know, six months rotations. Or it could be something like Voyager, <laughs> right? Voyager has been, was launched when? In 76? Voyager has been flying for 40 years and we're still getting data and telemetry at very low data rates, like, you know, 100 bits per second or something like this, but still that's remarkable, right? So phase E in that case is very long. Uh, so it's worth really thinking about this. All right, let me talk about commissioning. So commissioning is essentially the transition from phase D to phase E. So phase D is system assembly, integration, test, and launch, and transition to use. And phase E is then operations and sustainment. So to conduct the mission, meet the initially identified need, maintain support, and then implement your mission operations plan. So commissioning essentially is transitioning from phase D to phase E, and usually the people that will operate the system day in, day out, tend to be different people than the people who designed the system, who built the system, who launched the system. So usually you have some kind of a handoff or handover of the system from you know, the designers, builders, to the operators. And, and that handover is, is very important that it be done well. And that's what we call commissioning. Uh, or, in this case, this is the do you remember this? We haven't shown this for a while. Remember, what, what do we call this, this thing here? The engine, right? The systems engineering engine at every level, right? So this is step nine, product, product transitioning process. And then there's a, you know, there has to be a flow chart, right? Can't do without a flow chart. It's not particularly fancy or anything, but the idea is that, you know, you have an inputs, which are the end product, ready to be used, documentation. So when I ask you, um, I ask you about the cryogenic system, you know, you mentioned the cryogenic system. I ask you, do you have a user manual for it? So that would be here in this box here on the left side, right? The documentation that goes with the end product and then any product transition enabling products. So those would be things that you only use during the transition, you know, like equipment or facilities that you just use for uh, for this transitioning process and then you don't use them during operations. You can have, you can think of examples of that. And, and then you go through this multiple steps. Um, there may be multiple sites that you have to prepare, multiple locations. And at the end of it, you know, you've delivered the end product. It's operational transition work products and, uh, and you're essentially uh, operational. So, um, what, what it means in practice is deploying the system in the field, transitioning to the operators physically and legally also. I should point this out. This is really important. So usually in this uh, commissioning phase, the legal, ownership, the legal ownership of the product or the asset is transferred from one organization to the other. So if it breaks now, it's your problem. It's not my problem. You've already taken ownership. You've signed off on it. And, you know, for insurance purposes, this is a very big deal. So at what point does legal ownership of the asset transition? You really have to know that. Uh, and then, of course, the training. Checkout. Checkout means turning on all your systems and subsystems, right? Making sure everything works, ma making sure there's no emergent behaviors, weird behaviors, unexpected behaviors, comparing 
the predicted parameters against the actual behaviors. Does the system behave as we had predicted, you know, based on calculations or, you know, these days we usually build simulations, right? We build a pretty realistic simulation of the system and we, we have, there's the concept of digital twin. Who's heard, who's heard this before? Digital twin. Who's heard this before? Oh, nobody. Okay. So the idea of a digital twin is that here's your physical system, you know, airplane, satellite, CubeSat, whatever it is, medical device, and there's a digital twin of it. There's a, there's a uh, in silico version, a simulated twin of that system that exists somewhere. And, you know, before you turn the system on and, and do operations on it, you do it on the digital twin to see what will happen and predict, you know, everything, all the parameters, the position, velocity, accelerations, temperatures, pressures. So if things look good in the digital twin, then you actually do it in the real system. So for example, JPL with their Mars rovers, they will do that. They have a digital twin, right? They have a digital version. They actually have a physical twin too, but they typically only use that if there's problems like, you know, stuck in a sand dune or something like this. So you actually, you, you simulate the commands that you're going to send to the spacecraft on your digital twin, make sure that the command sequence is correct, uh, that things will, you know, and then you do it on the real system. That's, that's, that's what we mean here. And during checkout, you do it initially, but actually if it's a very complex system, you might do this uh, as a matter of routine. And then sustainment uh, is the third thing here. So sustainment means maintenance, both preventative and corrective. So preventative maintenance means you're taking actions before the system breaks. Corrective action means you're taking maintenance actions after you have failures. Of, of different kind, spare parts management, uh, reconfiguring system during use for different purposes, upgrading system, and then retrofits. So what, what, a retro, what, what is a retrofit? Anybody know, like at EPFL, are you familiar with the term retrofit? Have you heard this word before? Volker, do you want to explain what it means? Absolutely. So, for example, let's take your ministry example in Switzerland. We uh, Switzerland bought uh, M109 howitzers uh, from USA back in the 60s, 70s, and these things are aluminum, large, uh, self-propelled howitzers. And in the 80s, 90s, they decided to not throw them away; they don't rust, but to retrofit them to put a guidance navigation system, a new cannon. And so we went into a retrofit program, meaning you sort of break down everything down to the uh, lowest uh, elements, you decide what you can keep, you throw away the uh, obsolete stuff, you buy new things, and you try to make it fit. Yep. And then you recomp. So retrofit typically means you physically go out in the field and you, you physically change the system. You, like Volker said, you remove things, you, you typically add new things. So you, now you have like old generation and new generation stuff mixed up in the system. Retrofitting is a huge deal, particularly in, in, in the military, but in, in other domains as well, like, you know, hospitals, infrastructure, uh, you know, train systems. Uh, you go there and you'll see, you see a mix of, you know, old stuff, you know, from when the system was originally built and deployed, and then new stuff layered on top of it through retrofits. And the key question, of course, when you do a retrofit is uh, you want the retrofit not to interfere with, you know, you want it to actually be value added as opposed to causing more problems. Yeah, go ahead. Is retrofit the same as medium life upgrade? Um, I, would, I would say it this way, a, a medium life or middle, middle of the life upgrade is a particular type of retrofit that you do roughly halfway through the nominal mission life. Yes. And you know, that could, uh, do you have experience with, with such upgrade? Uh, yes, actually we have both F5 and AMX in Brazil, we have the medium life upgrade and both performed by Embraer. Okay. So it's interesting because the F5, for example, is Northrop and the medium life upgrade was performed by Embraer and we had lots of issues about it. So what was done to the airplane? Uh, completely change of the, the, the dashboard panels and new electronic warfare equipment but they kept the old hydraulics engine and 
actually hydraulics and engine. The, the electrical uh, <laughs> system was changed as well. Was changed as well. So you keep the frame, the engine. And you change the radar, the antennas, and lots of different stuff. That makes sense. That new head-up display, new helmet, stuff like that. You know, and the, the interesting discussion, which um, I think in the U.S. for m much equipment and Switzerland, same discussions, is, you know, by the time you start adding up the cost of a midlife upgrade or retrofit, you start adding all these things up, pretty quickly you come to the question, well, wow, that's pretty expensive. You know, is it really worth it investing X millions or billions, you know, to squeeze another, you know, 10, 15 years out of this platform, or should we just buy a new one and retire this one. And you'll have very vigorous debates about that. Yeah? Does how the funding structure ever come into play when determining how sustainable or how you're going to retrofit something? I know sometimes uh, where we work, like your funding ends this time and something else starts up this time. So sometimes you kind of design a little bit around those things. Is that ever taken into consideration? Well, I think enlightened companies and enlightened organizations will actually build in retrofit and upgrade costs into their original budgets. But does it happen often? Does it ha you know, it's, 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 I think it's a minority of organizations who really are honest to think about the full life cycle cost, including upgrades and retrofits. And to be honest, I mean, sometimes these retrofits, you, it's hard to know about them ahead of time. And so in some cases, you can predict them. But, but in many cases, you know, it's more reactive. In fact, um, I'll tell you a story about the, um, uh, the F-18. Uh, these retrofits often come in bundles or packages called ECRs or engineering, um, ECPs, I'm sorry, engineering change proposals. They're sort of packages of changes. And uh, it's almost, I don't want to say blackmail, but it's like here's a bundle of changes that is, you know, X million dollars. And it's up to you whether you want to implement that or not. But if you choose not to implement, then the, wa the warranty is void or we will, we will basically, there's, you're losing compatibility with any future upgrades. Do you see what I'm saying? So, so the configurations then start to diverge and then you have to make a, a tough decision. You know, do, you, do you spend money on an upgrade that maybe you don't absolutely need but some other customers want, wanted um, and if you say, no, we, we don't want this, we're going to freeze the configuration where we are today, then you might lose the option for future upgrades. And if you then choose to upgrade later, it could be much more expensive. And so th these are, you know, I, I know this, you know, say what, that's, that's systems engineering too. And it gets into technical issue, financial issues, strategic issues. So, you know, I, I hope you're getting a sense here that Oper this is all happening during operations. This is fascinating stuff. This is not boring. This is not just routine operations. Okay, so um, I think it's, uh, so, you know, in operations, we have launch for spacecraft science operations, safe hold, anomaly resolution, and so forth. And I just want to show you a quick video here about um, the James Webb Space. This is one minute video about the anticipated deployment of the James Webb Space Telescope. I think I mentioned to you, I worked on this as a master's student. It's supposed to launch, in, this is supposed to happen in 2018. Uh, launched from Kourou on an Ariane rocket. This is a NASA um, ESA collaboration. You can see right now the spacecraft has been launched. It's deploying its sun shield. Uh, these are very thin membranes. The purpose of the sun shield is to keep the optics cold. The optics are on the top here. And uh, this, there's spreaders and uh, there shouldn't be any wrinkles. And there's multiple layers. You can see the layers now. First you spread it out horizontally. Now the layers are being spread. It has to be right at the right angles. And I don't know what's happening right now, but the last step is that The last step that should happen, I guess it didn't quite play until the end, but the last thing that happens is the optics are then deployed. And then the optical deployment is also very, um, very involved and has to be very precise. So let me just minimize this. Um, so, and, this, and then after that you have a commissioning. 
I should also mention that the James Webb State, when I worked on it, it was a $500 million mission. It's now become an $8 billion mission. But the purpose of this instrument is to look back in time to what's known as the Dark Ages. It's basically like 300,000 years to about 100 million years after the Big Bang, the formation of the very first proto-galaxies. We can't observe that right now with Hubble or from the ground, mainly because these are so far away because of the expansion of the universe that the radiation is, is redshifted, and this is all in the infrared. So you have to have a very quiet, very cold instrument to see these first proto-galaxies ga being formed. So, you know, we can argue, is it worth spending $8 billion to see the very first galaxy being formed or not? People will debate it, but the fact is it's happening. Uh, James Webb will launch, and then it's going to go through a commissioning phase, like I just talked about. So I, I want you to answer this question here. Uh, how long do you think the commissioning phase of the James Webb Space Telescope will take? Three days, a week, uh, in orbit that is. Three days, a week, three weeks, a month, three months, six months, or you're not sure. So answer that question and then we'll take a short break, like five minutes, and uh, look at the answer. Yeah. Are they uh, still on schedule with the, the telescope or do you have any idea on whether <laughs> that'll slip some more? You know, when I worked on it, it was supposed to launch in uh, 2008. Right? So it's, uh, but I do think, you know, I mean, the, the spacecraft is being integrated right now at Northrop Grumman. We saw it in January. So they're not lying to us, I think. They're actually putting things together. And um, yeah, I, I, think, um, I think it's going to launch in, in 20, maybe the slip by another six months or maybe a year, but not more. I don't think so. B basically, um, how long does it take from, from what you just saw in the video? Until uh, PIs, principal investigators, can, scientists, can astronomers can start using it for real science, how long will that take? So who, uh, who wants to uh, respond? Who thinks uh, it's like uh, a month, three weeks, a week, le a month or less? Who responded to that? A month or less? Go ahead. Just what, what, what were you thinking? Well, I already had nice specific idea. <laughs> what, 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 what were you imagining would happen? Well, I thought that it couldn't be very, very long because, you know, if they need, if you need to be, well, it's, if the objective is to collect data, well, you can't wait that much before you start using it. But I had no specific ideas. Really, I, so. No, I, I think that's a good answer. I mean, you know, you deploy the, 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 the solar panels, right, the, the sh sun shield, the optics. Mm. You know, the spacecraft's at the right place. By the way, this is going to launch to an uh, Earth trailing orbit, like Earth, Earth Sun L2 kind of trailing orbit. So it's, it's kind of away from the Earth, from albedo, all that. You know, so you deployed it. Let's get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Um, and then I think 37% of you, a third of you thought maybe three months, and then 40% about six months. All right, so let's look at the uh, current plans. And I, I, uh, I took some slides here from, uh, I referenced it, from a, a lady that works at the Space Telescope Science Institute that's located in at Baltimore, NASA Goddard Space Center, Baltimore. This is from last year. So here's the plan to launch in October of 2018 and then do the deployment. And the answer is right now six months. Six months commissioning phase. And then there's different cycles of so GO stands for guest observer. So you have sort of primary PIs. They usually get first dibs. And then you have uh, observing time for t um, guest observers. Here's another a little bit more detailed. So full, full schedule of deployment and checkout activities. A limited set of science calibration ops possible. Science observations highly unlikely during the six months phase. Mm -hmm. And then you have this guest observer program. And there's a budget, actually, guaranteed time obs observation program from April of 2019, uh, a total of 3,960 hours allocated in the first 30 months after al commissioning, okay? And, and so those 3,960 hours are, are people will fight over this and there's a very detailed process for how to allocate and compete for that obs observation time, okay? But the answer here is six months and it really it surprised me too 
that it's going to take this long. But the the uh, the the reason it takes so, so long is mainly calibration, right? Mm -hmm. Calibration is a big thing. You want to make sure that all the observations you're going to take are correct. And in order to do proper calibration, you have to essentially image things that have already been imaged before right, by other instruments that were also properly calibrated. So that for a known set of targets, you know you're getting the same answer. And that just takes time. That, I mean, I think in a nutshell, that's the, the main reason it takes so long. And that's, okay. Yep, go ahead. There's, there's also the one aspect with this uh, observatory is that it has to be stabilized. And as we get to bring it up from Earth, even though it's pulled together in a clean room, a very high cleanliness, it's going to have to deploy. And then just to get the chemical stabilization, it's going to take weeks before they even can start to calibrate the instruments. Because you have to get the outgassing of all the volatile substances and get, that they move far away, not from the spacecraft. Uh, actually dilute in space, get stabilization of temperature, and then you can only start uh, checking instruments. Great point. So thermal stability, outgassing, you know, so you really, everything is very stable. Yeah, very good point. Okay, um, so let me talk briefly, I'm going to go through two examples of research in operations, and then we'll talk about the post-flight review. All right, so the first thing, uh, th this is, uh, each of these two examples are based on papers. So spare parts requirements for space missions with reconfigurability and commonality. This is uh, based on uh, a paper in uh, Journal of Spacecraft and Rockets, 2007. So, um, the, and this work was done during the Constellation program, which was, you know, we're going to go back to the moon. Uh, we will reestablish a human presence on the moon. And uh, we're going to bring a whole bunch of stuff with us, more than we did during Apollo, to do this. So the picture on the upper right, you see a habitat uh, on top of a lander stage. You see an ascent vehicle with a lander stage. You see a rover that looks kind of similar to the lunar rover, but there's also a pressurized version of it. So we're going to bring a whole bunch of stuff. And the challenge is, uh, during operations, things will break. So you need to bring spare parts to support all this. And you know, some recent research we've done in my group shows that for Mars, it's the same problem, right? You're going to stay there a long time. You don't know exactly what will break, but if you want a high uh, probability of being able to successfully operate, you do need to bring spares. So uh, the idea that was explored here is what if those spares could be common or reconfigurable and you can do scavenging? So the idea is that instead of bringing a dedicated spare, you know, if you give these three systems that are shown here, the Habitat, the Ascent Vehicle, and the Rover, to three different companies to build, and they don't talk to each other, and you don't impose any commonality requirements, you're going to get very different solutions. You know, the, what's the classic example of this in space flight, human space flight? Apollo 13, what happened in Apollo 13? The cartridges, right, for the CO2 scrubbing, square cartridges versus round cartridges, well, the two different contractors, they didn't talk to each other. The government didn't say you have to make these common, so they weren't common. So the idea here is what is the effect of reconfigurable and common spares on system availability uh, if you allow temporary scavenging and, and cannibalization of systems that aren't used? And so one thing you need for that is an operational profile for each element. And that's shown in the lower left. So this is essentially a binary. A zero, zero means that particular element is, is dormant or not being used, right? It's kind of in slumber mode. And one means it's actively being used. And so th then we have at each of these time periods, T1, T2, T3, are time periods where there's a change in the operational status of a particular element. Either it goes from you know, sleeping mode to active mode or from active mode to inactive mode. And so knowing these cycles, operational profiles, is very important to do the analysis. All right, sorry, this is a little bit of math here. I'm not going to go through this in detail. But basically, when you do classical Mm, sparing and maintainability and failure analysis, you assume that failures arrive according to a pro Poisson process. So this is, a, this is the equation for a Poisson distribution. So this is, uh, and then you can see the, the, the various variables that are used here. So lambda, your lambda is your failure rate. 
Um, P of n is the probability to have exactly n failures. Um, and then we have the, um, down here, we have the spares that are available to you. And there's, there's really, sp spares can come from, um, from two different sources. One is you bring spares with you from Earth, right? So this is a spares from repository, S sub I. These are spares you brought with you as a, as a pool of spares. And then S sub E are spares that you take out of elements that are not being used. So these are spares that are scavenged temporarily from inactive elements. That's S sub E minus N sub F, which is the number of failures that, you've, that have occurred up to that point. Right? So the total number of spares available at any given point in time is your initial spares pool plus spares you can scavenge from other inactive elements in the, in the system minus uh, elements that have already failed. And this is, assuming you, uh, this is assuming no repair, so you can't repair, and it assumes that you know ahead of time what the operational profile is. So the spares available from elements from scavenging is, is this equation here. It's essentially the sum over all the elements, capital E. E is the, capital E is the number of elements in your architecture. Q sub E is something known as quantity per application, QPA also. So basically, you know, if you have like a, a mission computer or in like UAVs, we have servos, right? Like, you know, this particular element has six servos, identical servos that are used on the vehicle. So QPA this QE would be six, right? So and if that element isn't used, we could go in, take out a servo, put it in somewhere else. And so we can treat that as a spare, at least during the period where that UAV isn't used. Does that make sense? Okay. So the difference then is that in the kind of classic way of doing it, we have dedicated spares. Each element, one, element one, element I, element E, has dedicated spares that only work on that vehicle, right? You can't, there's no swapping, there's no scavenging, there's no commonality. And therefore, your spares repository, S sub I, is going to be pretty big because there's no commonality and no sparing. In, the, in this new situation, you have reconfigurable or common parts. So we still have a spares repository, but now those spares can be deployed across all or a subset of the elements. Plus, we can treat, and this is this dashed line here, we can treat uh, elements that are part of I idle elements, we can treat them temporarily as being part of the spares repository. Does that make sense? So that's, that's a much more kind of, in a sense, uh, smarter way to do. And uh, the question is, what's the benefit of this? So, <clears throat> you know, in order to calculate um, in order to calculate the benefits for this, uh, we essentially, we have some constraints. So for example, the number of failures uh, that you can have is between, you know, if you have a zero failures, that's great. That's your lower floor. And then capital N is the total number of units you have in your architecture, including the ones in the, in the uh, inventory, in the initial inventory, and plus the ones that are built into all the vehicles. And then the key here is what's known as back order level. So back order essentially is um, the number of spares that um, that you would that, that you would need, but may not. So when the back order level becomes larger than zero, it essentially means that your number of failures have exceeded the number of spares that you have. You don't have you don't have enough spares to satisfy all your operational needs. So this is this. Um, uh, conditional back order at spares level S, and you, you sum that essentially then over all the possible failure states that you could see. And why is that useful? Because you can then calculate essentially your element availability. So A, A is your availability of at time Ti, and then A of your availability of the whole system is the minimum of your system availability at any time and point during your mission horizon, your mission time, capital T. Do you see how that works? So you, you, you have your, element, your spares, you have failures of these spares, which are random, um, and then you can calculate, are you going to have enough spares to operate every element that you need to operate when it's supposed to be operational, right? And the back order level, this number B here, 
is what you use, uh, you look at your back order level across the whole mission timeline to see what your system availability will be. And there's a, there's a closed form, uh, you know, if you, if you there's a closed form sort of approximation of this. And then, for, you know, for a m larger number of elements and different QPAs and so forth, you typically then have to switch to simulation, like Monte Carlo simulations. So um, what, are the, you know, what are the results here? So this was applied to, the example here is a um, co-located mission elements. Uh, this is for, I think it was a lunar mission. And uh, you define essentially the operational time profile, quantity per application, and so forth. And the example that was used was an electronic control unit, an ECU, with, an, with a mean time to failure of 100,000 hours. So failure rate is 1 over mean time to failure. Lambda is the expected failure rate is 1 over mean time to failure. So pretty reliable, right? 100,000 hours of operation, mean time to failure, is, is, it, that's pretty reliable. Uh, but of course, you know, you're far from Earth. You know, this, this is a 600-day timeline. And you can see here the operational profiles for your various mission elements. So this is actually kind of reminds you of The Martian, right? The, Anybody seen the movie The Martian recently? Who's seen The Martian? Who's not seen The Martian? <laughs> you got to go. You're the only one in the room. It's a great movie. <laughs> so, uh, you know, he basically, he does scavenging and, you know, even things that weren't supposed to be scavenged. And, and so um, we have four elements here. We have the PR, which is the pressurized rover, the habitat, the... Uh, uh, all-terrain vehicle, and then the ADV, which is the ascent-descent vehicle. In this case, it's the same vehicle for ascent and descent. And so, you know, the ascent-descent vehicle, you only need it when you land and when you depart, right? The rest of the time, it's dormant. The ha habitat is used while you're on the surface. The ATV is used while you're on the surface. And then the pressurized rover is used. The assumption here is, you know, you're going to operate for like 100 days very close to the base. And only after 100 days are you going to start going further away with the pressurized rover. So those are the operational profiles. Yeah? Uh, is there an argument that you wouldn't want to be <coughs> scavenging parts from your ascent and descent vehicle, though? Uh, that's know. a good point. So if, if, um, if you basically, your back order level is too high and you run out of your last spare the day before you're supposed to launch on the ADV, you're in trouble, right? So, but, but if that's the case, then... Um, then what you have to do is you have to exclude, you have to exclude, uh, you know, the minimum, and there may be redundancy, right, in that ascent vehicle, and you may, may or may not be willing to sacrifice the redundancy. I mean, this is all about risk, right, uh, and, and exclude, uh, those are keep out spares that you cannot touch, because if you can't, then you can't, can't, can't uh, get back home, so you just don't count those in your spares pool, if that's the case. But you can still do the, the, the whole analysis. Okay, so what's the, uh, what's the bottom line here? What's the punchline here? So the punchline is that if you, um, if you have a dedicated, the, the D case here is the dedicated case, okay? So this is where there's no scavenging, there's no commonality of spares among these elements. You have to have dedicated spares. And let's assume you want a 90% availability you know, which is not, not that high. I mean, that's a fairly, you know, that's a relatively modest uh, requirement. You want 90% availability. What it means is you need to have, uh, in, this, in this case, you can see the line just crosses below here, this, this crossover. You need four spares, right? In your initial spares pool for, the, for this electronic control unit, you have to have at least four spares, dedicated spares, for that electronic control unit for a 600-day mission for a unit that has 100,000 uh, MTTF or MTBF um, to guarantee at least 90% availability. And you say, oh, that's not a big deal. That's just four spares. Well, that's just one, one unit. That's just one box, right? You probably have dozens of boxes or even hundreds across all these elements. And so that's, you know, that could be a lot of spares. You know, you translate that to mass and volume, that's a big deal. So um, in, the, in the closed, you know, using closed form analytics to calculate the, the minimum number of spares you need, this is the R case, the reconfigurable case. 
you can see that you can achieve that same requirement with two spares. You see that? That's this line here. It's this line here. And this is a conservative model. This is a conservative model. So by doing reconfigurable and common spares and scavenging, you can cut your number of spares in half. You can cut your number of spares in half and still achieve a 90% system availability. Right? And then no, you multiply that across all the elements in your architecture. And that's a, that's a big deal. And then this result here, so this is a rigorous bound because it's, you know, it makes some conservative assumptions and it uses closed form equations to calculate this. And the details are in the paper. And then this, this curve here is the simulated. So if you, if you simulate this using essentially a discrete event simulation several times and then you take averages, it's actually even a little better. It's, this suggests you could even get away with one spare, but it's not as, it's not as conservative as, as the closed form solution. Okay, so the, the bottom line is reconfigurable parts allow for 33 to 50% reduction in the number of required spares for a 90% availability level. But if you think about what that means operationally, it means that you really have to know ahead of time what's going to be operational when. You have to have the crew trained to be able to actually go in and scavenge. And the equipment, the vehicles, have to be designed such that you can actually remove this stuff and put it back in relatively easily. So that would impose some you know, accessibility and replaceability and maintainability requirements. Right? The, other, the other option is you say, oh, we don't want spares. Well, then you need to do a lot of redundancy, and then your vehicles are going to get heavy and more complex. I mean, those are the real-world trade-offs. Yeah, Sam? Does this potentially increase the risk for the, the crew of the mission if there is some sort of inherent failure in the particular part uh, since it's being used everywhere? So uh, either, I don't know if you looked ahead or you just, uh, I know you're a smart guy, Sam, so... Um, this is this this is the, this is the answer to your question right here. So um, um, so the question so so you know this is great. Okay, we, we like we like the fact that we can cut down on the number of spares and still meet the same availability. But um, you can ask the question in different ways, right? So on the left side is a kind of sensitivity analysis that says, well, maybe we're not so mass constrained. We have plenty of transportation. Uh, capacity, so we're not really uh, mass constrained, but we know that designing ultra reliable electronic boxes or whatever components is very expensive, right? So, um, what can we basically um, can we decrease the requirement on the manufacturer of these boxes, and can we go from say a hundred thousand to seventy five thousand MTTF? So we're decreasing the nominal reliability of of the equipment by a fourth. We're making the job easier for the supplier of that box. Presumably, that should be cheaper, right? We should, that should be a cheaper box to design and build. So what will happen if we drop the reliability requirement by 25%? And then you can see the impact here. So the, the blue curve is essentially what you get for the less reliable equipment. And then the black was the original, OK? So now Sam's question. So this is basically the answer. So here's your failure rate. Okay, this is your failure rate, 10 to the minus 3. And we're varying the failure rate over a large range. And then we're looking at system availability. This is for a fixed number of spares. Okay? And what's really interesting, so when, when your equipment is, um, when your failure rate is low, so we're on the, um, on the left side, then the blue curve is lower, the dedicated case. So for a fixed number of spares, for relatively reliable equipment, you're better off going with the reconfigurable or common spares. That's because, so system availability is, this is logarithmic, so it's a little tricky. So system availability is higher when you have common and reconfigurable spares, relatively reliable equipment. But there's a crossover point. If, if, you're, if your boxes, your, uh, your elements, your components are very unreliable, which is on the right side, there's actually a crossover point. And the idea is that, well, now because it's common and reconfigurable across all the vehicles, you have this really bad box that breaks all the time. 
Now the problem is everywhere. Every vehicle, everything is affected by it, whereas before it was kind of more contained, right? And so that's what that crossover is. So if, if, if you're in a situation with very unreliable equipment, unreliable components, you're actually worse off making them common or reconfigurable. And you can now calculate where that crossover point is. That's pretty cool, don't you think? <laughs> I get excited about this stuff. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but this is, you know, this is real. This is what you care, in, in operations, this is, you know, how many spares of each kind, you know, can we guarantee that, we're, you know, we can successfully do this campaign, you know, whether it's a military campaign or, you know, you go to Antarctica and, you know, we heard about the Octanus rover and, you know, it's just one rover, but all, what's all the stuff that you need to bring with you in terms of spares to make sure you can actually have a successful campaign and, and have a guarantee of that? Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if uh, the reconfigurability argument also has some sort of impact on the uh, kind of finances and manufacturability in terms of if you're making reconfigurable parts for different things, they may be more similarly manufactured and therefore may represent a decrease in, in cost on the manufacturing side, and if that's another that, motivation. That's a great point. <clears throat> and w what I will say about that is that in order to capture that benefit, you need to lock that in contractually. So if they're, you know, either you give all this work to the same manufacturer and, and say, okay, you're now making 50 boxes instead of just five, there has to be a discount on a per unit basis for that. Uh, or if it's different manufacturers, then it gets hard, right? So yes, but you have to have the kind of uh, business arrangements that will allow you to capture that value. Uh, EPFL, do you guys, were you able to follow this? Uh, I know this is pretty detailed discussion here on these curves. Is it, Maxime, you're, you're sort of shaking your head. Uh, is, it, is it clear? Not totally, but I, I guess, yeah, maybe I can give you a, a concrete, practical, out of everyday life example that you probably, except you all, you probably know about, it, unless other people of you have kids. That imagine you go with your uh, car on vacation for two weeks and your children all need uh, uh, pampers, I mean, nappies. And uh, you can take them with from your store where you know how they are. They are more expensive, but reliable. But you don't know how many you're going to consume, but you there's a certain minimum amount per day, and you hope you don't uh, go over the limit. Now, it takes lots of volume, and so you have to trade off your space because you're fixed space in your car. You cannot take more than the volume available. And so this, this is exactly the kind of reliability curve you have. If you take too little with, you have to buy the wrong stuff, when you get there, wherever you are, and then it might uh, have leaks and failures, <laughs> and not worth as well, so you'll need more than what you thought initially, and cost more as well. So actually, okay. this is extremely important in everyday okay. life. Okay, so I, 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 I like your, ex I'm, um, I'm past that stage with my kids, you know, several years, but, no, but I, I'm gonna amend your example in the following way. Basically, if you had two kids, you know, and they're very different, like, you know, one is really tall and, you know, they, they, their same diapers will not fit, then you have a problem, right? Uh, but if they're twins or if you buy stretchable diapers that have a huge range, then you can cut down, right? So you, you have to have, like, different kids in the car. Then it works. I think then the example works. Okay. Uh, let's see, we're, we're kind of running short on time. So one more example. This is based on the doctoral thesis of Jeremy Akte. He's a flight test engineer. Um, and the question that he looked at was robustness of degraded airplanes. So the, the idea here is that uh, some systems are going to be used longer and long ultra endurance kind of systems where you do not have the option of repair. You don't have the option to land, repair, and fix the system and bring it back to its pristine, you know, everything is working state. And on the right side here, you see some examples of, you know, these are real systems or that people have worked on or working on or thinking about that have this situation. The DARPA Vulture is a program where a UAV would stay aloft for five years with no landing and repair allowed. So you can obviously see it's got solar panels and I think it has fuel cells as well, if I'm not mistaken. So, you know, how do you achieve that? Uh, this is an example from Antarctica flying um, several UAVs to map the ice sheets. 
This was a, a, a gap solution while the ISAT satellite between ISAT 1 and ISAT 2. And then here's, uh, you know, here's a human co colony, maybe on the moon or uh, looks like the moon. So we have this dome here. This crater has been covered with a dome, and we have a greenhouse inside. So life support systems that have to be super reliable for a very long amount of time. And so um, the question that Jeremy looked at is, how do we design and optimize systems that have ultra-long endurance where you know ahead of time that failures will occur? Failures will occur, and you can't repair the failures easily. So you have to design the system a priori such that in those partially failed states, it will give you the maximum residual performance that it possibly could. And it turns out when, you're, when that's your objective function, you design the systems differently than if you just optimize nominal performance and then worry about, you know, what happens if, if there's failures. So here's a, and this is a, the second paper that I uploaded for you. So both of these papers, the, the, the reconfigurable spares and then this one are uploaded, uh, both on Moodle and Stellar, if you want to take a deeper look. So the case study here is a, the C-12. This is the King Air airplane. This is the military version of it. And it typically flies out of Edwards Air Force Base. And, um, and the idea is that uh, there can be different failures on this airplane. So this, this diagram, this is a so-called uh, Markov chain, where N means nominal. And you can see the table that goes with this. Nominal means nothing has failed. And you just do turn control. This is you know, climbing, a le left turn, climbing. You just do turn control with your ailerons, which is just standard flying. And then different failures could occur of different elements. So the left engine, the rudder, and the aileron could fail. I mean, of course, a lot more can fail, but in this case study, those are the elements that are allowed to fail. And so one, one means the left engine has failed, two means the rudder has failed, and three means the ailerons have failed. And then as you move to the right, it gets worse and worse, right? So state four means you lost your left engine and the aileron, but you still have your rudder, okay? And then the worst is state seven, where everything's failed. The left engine's failed, the rudder, and the aileron has failed. And what you worry about is what we call availability, right? Expected availability is, you know, what's the probability or fraction of t probability that the system will perform above some minimum threshold, which in this case we call WM. And then expected performance is the probability of each of these failure states multiplied by the performance that you're still getting in that failure state. Okay? And uh, what was done here is to say, okay, we know what the C-12 airplane looks like, the way it exists today. But what if that airplane had been designed slightly differently? You know, low value and high value around the baseline, a little bit bigger wing, bigger tail. Uh, how, would it impact, uh, how would it impact the performance, not just the nominal, but, but the off-nominal performance in these failed states? So <clears throat> just to show you why this is interesting or relevant, uh, I picked out the most interesting uh, failure states are the intermediate ones here, these partially failed states. And so on this picture, you can see uh, in red what's failed on the aircraft, and then plotting bank angle versus uh, specific excess power, which is essentially your ability to climb in feet per minute. And the idea, and this is all c calculated through a simulator, a pretty accurate six degree of freedom simulator, where you can actually modify the airplane. It's a very cool uh, open source simulator that Jeremy modified, where you can actually fly the airplane simulated and you can change the airplane during flight. <laughs> like you could grow the wings <laughs> as the airplane is flying, like morphing wings and thing, things like this. And of course here, uh, you, you fail parts of the airplane during flight and then the flight dynamics are automatically, the physics automatically have to adjust to that failure. So this is, you know, this is not like spreadsheet type analysis, just so you know. Um, so if you're inside the safe region here, then, uh, so you have a minimum, you can keep the bank angle between, we defined it between 25 and 35 degrees, and you have positive rate of climb, then uh, you're still in the safe region. And each of these points here is a slightly tweaked version of the baseline airpl airplane, okay? 
So what's interesting here is in, the, in some of these um, states, you're outside of the safe region. So a small difference in the design of the nominal airplane will mean the difference between losing the airplane or still being able to fly. So these points that, that are out here, these are the interesting points because they fall outside the safe region and the points inside are inside the safe region. Everything is the same except the airplane geometry has been tweaked, right? So, um, and then of course, you know, state seven, everything has failed. You lose the airplane. There's no way to recover the airplane. So in some cases, it's very clean. It's very clear what will happen. And in some cases, the, these intermediate failure states are the interesting ones because a small changes in the upfront design make a big difference in how the airplane will perform in a par partially degraded state or partially failed state. So the other thing you can do then is you can do a sensitivity analysis and say, well, how sensitive is, for example, expected performance to the various design variables in the airplane, like, you know, rudder cord and I'll talk about vertical tail here and the engine failure rate and so forth. And the difference between the yellow and the green is, it, the yellow is an eight-hour mission, so this is a typical eight-hour mission. You fly, you come back, and if something's failed, you just repair it. In the 20,000 mission, 20,000-hour mission, you can't come back and repair. So what you see here is, is interesting. It means the sensitivity of these design decisions to the performance, the sensitivity of the performance to these design decisions depends on how long you will operate the system. And because the longer you operate it, the more likely it is that it will see these, these partial failure modes, which will then influence the degraded or the residual performance of the airplane. Okay? And, and the most interesting parameter here, if you just look at this diagram, um, beside the engine failure rate, so you know, it's, the engine failure rate matters a lot right? when you, when you fly a 20,000 hour mission. But if, if you look at the, across these parameters, which one of these is the most interesting? Which one of these is the most interesting parameter? Let's see at EPFL. Can you see this diagram? Which one of these parameters is the most interesting? Go ahead. The vertical tail. Why? Because it has different behavior for the life cycle and just for the single mission? Yes. So if you're only going to fly short missions with it uh, and then land and repair, you see the sensitivity is off to the left, right? Slightly negative sensitivity. So you, you could actually make it just a little bit smaller. But if you're going to fly very long, you should actually make it bigger. And this, 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 is real, this, is, this particular airplane has an undersized vertical tail. It has a Dutch roll mode where it has a yaw damper that was added later. And so if, uh, if you're going to fly for a long, a long time period, you, um, you're going to see a failure mode that will then exasperate that particular failure mode. Right? So that's why, that's why the sen so it mean, what, it, what it means is that if you're actually going to design this airplane for a 20,000 hour mission, that, um, that you, would, you would design a much larger vertical tail which penalizes you in the nominal, you know, if everything is, it penalizes you in nominal operations, but it, um, uh, it will benefit you in these partially failed states. Does that make sense to you guys? You guys were, were uh, laughing or smiling or thinking yeah, about this. Yeah. So what, have you flown this airplane or do you have experience in it? We did a flight test course and we um, tested Dutch roll. <laughs> okay, commenting. so this brought up some, uh, Fuzzy memories, or mm -hmm. yeah. yes, sir. I mean, it's you know, it's basically the wingtip does like a right. figure eight, right? That's sort right. of the classic. That's the classic manifestation of Dutch roll. Yeah, and but but if the Dutch roll is too big, you can actually lose the airplane, yeah. right? You can induce mm -hmm. an instability. So this is a big deal. Yeah. Um, would that kind of mean that the vertical tail is sized properly then, because? You know, you can make it smaller and get a little better in this area, or make it bigger and get a little better in this area. Uh, it seems like the vertical. Uh, it's like it's, it's fine things. with the yaw damper. You know, it's fine with the yaw damper. But actually, there have been there have been, has been an airplane lost. Uh, there has been an airplane lost in flight, and uh, the accident investigation showed that uh, it was basically a Dutch roll mode that that became unstable, and um, and so the point here is. 
if you have a failure, then you're in trouble with a small vertical tail. But if, if you don't have a failure, then you're probably okay. And, and that's the whole point of me showing you this, is to make the point that if you are going to deal with a system or operate a system that is going to have a, a very long operational life, long endurance, without the possibility to land, repair, and send it back out, so it's going to be perfect and pristine on day one, and then gradually stuff will fail. And that's the case for, you know, infrastructure, bridges, spacecraft, you know, past Neptune, airplanes that are going to be aloft for five years. You just have to design them differently. You just have to design, and this is hard for engineers to think about, that, you know, I'm actually designing for failure. I am, I am designing a system expecting that it will partially fail. Not completely, but partially fail. And by taking that into account, the design looks different. Okay? This is kind of non-conventional. Okay, final thing, post-flight review. What happens at the post-flight or post-launch review? PLR, PFR. So, you know, essentially what you do is you, you review the telemetry from flight. You compare against your predictions. You find repair any failures. You secure the data for later use. And then you initiate the detailed commissioning and handover to operations. And here's a detailed list of, you know, entrance and success criteria for post-flight review. And I put this up here because those of you that will actually go to the CANSAT competition, this is part of the package, right? You are expected to launch your payload, do the flight, and, you know, if something goes wrong, you can maybe have a backup flight. And then after the flight, you do a, a post-flight review. And you know, good post-flight reviews are planned ahead. You already know, you know, what data you're going to analyze. Maybe you already have your software ready to, to suck in the data after the flight and really get insights out of it. Summary here, uh, this is just kind of a checklist for thinking about operations. Um, you know, check, system checkout in the lab hangar field, is everything working okay? Bring sufficient consumables, spare parts, tools, support equipment, uh, remote control, telemetry, cameras, train the operators and support personnel, uh, checklists for nominal operations and routine, uh, emergency and contingencies, think about your transportation logistics, and plan in enough time for ramp up for commissioning before operations. Okay, so that was uh, all I wanted to cover today. Any, any questions about commissioning and operations? You know, my main point in this lecture today was to I kind of get you excited about operations, you know, and, and to, to highlight that there's a lot here. System engineers are not done. You know, after CDR or PDR, you say, ah, oh, I did my job as a system engineer. It's up to you guys, the operators. No. No. This is, this is uh, territory for system engineering as well. And, uh, you know, in the end, you just have to get operational experience. There's no substitute for actually being out in the field operating systems and uh, getting that experience, okay? Any, any questions or comments about this? Okay, so quick reminder, quick reminder, we're gonna have, um, we're gonna have our PDR. Uh, you saw the schedule, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Please log in five minutes before. We're gonna be using my WebEx uh, personal room. The link is here, upload your slide deck. 30 minutes presentation, and then we have up to 30 minutes of Q&A. All right? Questions?